And welcome to tonight's webinar. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is a live webinar. First time we've done this in a while. And uh, we're happy to have you with us. And here's Danielle. You haven't seen her in a while either. Yes, I'm here. I'm really here. <laughs> yeah, she is. Yeah. So tonight is a, a special webinar. And uh, we've been uh, promoting this for a good reason. You know, a lot of us are seeing patients and we're saying, all right, how do we explain it? How do we get there? What do we do in order to be able to make the patient understand what's going on? Well, part of that is uh, for the patient to actually uh, learn what's going on, for the patient to make those decisions uh, based on education, education we can provide. And there's special ways of, of, of providing that education. And Dr. Brian Bense, who's our guest, along with Lynn Turk, as office manager and treatment coordinator, are here with you uh, to be able to uh, show us exactly what they do, how they develop the case, and how we might be able to learn to develop our cases um, as a result of, um, of, 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 of their teaching. Um, uh, Brian and, uh, and Lynn are in practice in Oak Terrace, uh, Illinois, that's near the suburb of Chicago. Uh, and they practice uh, from right upstairs from George Mandelaris, many of you know George. So um, with that, um, I introduce to you Dr. Brian Benson and Lynn Turk. Welcome. All right, well thanks Lee. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I'm going to kind of figure all this stuff out. So I assume right now I'm sharing the screen and all you're seeing is that one slide. Is that correct? Uh, we are seeing the one slide with the index with, with the thumbnails on the left side. Okay. I got to go into play mode then here. So now it's that way. You just got you have the one slide, correct? You got it. Okay, great. So our, our talk today is going to be about co-discovery and co-diagnosis, the key to complex treatment plan acceptance. <laughs> but I really feel that, you know, the focus goes on complex treatment plan acceptance because that's oftentimes where we get into the problems with patients uh, not accepting treatment. But in fact, it's really kind of about for me, how to get patients on board with having sustainable oral health for a lifetime and hopefully not even getting into the complex treatment plan situation. So the co-diagnosis process is what we're trying to uh, come up with with our patients, but really it's the co-discovery of the problems that they really articulate to us in our uh, new patient consultation when they come in asking for help. So like Lee was saying that we and Danielle were in Oak Brook Terrace, Illinois, and it's a suburb of uh, Chicago, about 30 miles uh, straight west of Chicago. If you need to get a hold of us for any reason, Vence Dentistry at VenceDDS.com is our email. So my practice uh, organization is really around these dip five different areas. Planning, which is to me the most important component. Preventative, restorative, replacement, and wellness. So the planning part is the co-discovery, uh, you know, kind of finding out what patients are, you know, what, what's, what is, are their issues with their oral health? Um, you know, trying to develop a plan of how they want to treat that. One of the problems with you know, working today with so many options on uh, being able to take on different problems with a lot of different, uh, you know, potential treatment plans. We have to find out what the patient's preference is, how much time, money, and energy, and what kind of outcome they're looking for so that we can treat their problems based on their preferences. The preventative part really kind of goes in not only to the hygiene component, but also to um, preventing problems with you know, caries management, caries control, uh, and also sleep apnea as it impacts, you know, erosion and attrition due to the sleep apnea. Restorative is taking the different tooth elements, the structural integrity of the tooth, and restoring that structural integrity of that tooth uh, to preserve the biologic health so they don't need uh, endodontics, so they don't lose a tooth due to fracture and involve the periodontal component. Replacement. Obviously, when that does happen, when we failed in that regard, or we've let things go too long, or the structural integrity of the tooth is so compromised that when we do restore it, 
five, six, seven, eight, ten years down the road, it fractures, then we have tooth replacement with implants. And wellness, you know, is kind of the whole body, the systemic aspect of the patient, not only the overall body inflammation, trying to, you know, educate people about keeping that down, but um, the periodontal situation and, like I said before, sleep apnea. Because what we see with sleep apnea is a lot of attrition and erosion of the teeth, where then you get into these really complex problems because they've, you know, basically decimated their occlusion and now they're starting to put too much force on the anterior teeth and things like that. So how do we go ahead and uh, kind of integrate all this stuff? And just for a disclosure, we've not received any compensation or corporate support related to the material or concepts presented in the following presentation. And, you know, really there's, uh, this is, there's nothing here to sell. It's basically how can you work in a more authentic way with your patients? So my journey in the dentistry really began when my mom and dad met in Cuba. And my dad came over from Havana, Cuba. And when he came over here, he didn't really know what to do. He was 20 years old. He'd seen a dental lab in Havana. And so he went to a dental lab and started working in the dental lab, cleaning it. And they worked him up through the ranks, you know, plaster bench and, uh, and then on into setting dentures and then partials. And then he ended up managing a, a large dental lab in Deerfield, which was Frank Bash's lab. I think DAL ended up buying them out eventually. But my dad went into uh, his own practice, his own lab, uh, working for a, a, a dentist in Bartlett, Illinois. So he had a small lab where he had his own accounts. And he also worked with this one dentist. And that's where I became interested in dentistry. And so he had me come in in eighth grade, started to clean the lab, then he worked me up to the plaster bench and so on up the ranks of a removable dental lab. My uncle, on the other hand, he went into fixed and he had a fixed lab. So by the time I got the dental school, I'd cast the teeth, things like this. And so, you know, one of the problems that I had when I was waxing teeth up and stuff was space appropriation problems, but I didn't understand it was a space appropriation problem. And so it took a long time before I kind of developed that interdisciplinary concept where we work with the orthodontist, the periodontist, uh, the oral surgeon, endodontist, and have an interdisciplinary approach to get the teeth in the right position in the patient's face for optimal aesthetics and function. Um, then I got this note uh, when I graduated from dental school. Dr. Gibson from the VA Hospital of California called, wanted me to call him back the next morning, and I got accepted to a the VA Wadsworth in with, affiliated with UCLA. And that was a really good journey because that got me out to California after dental school and introduced eventually to Carl Reeder and Sherilyn Sheets, uh, the Newport Harbor Academy, where they brought in speakers every uh, nine months out of the year. They brought a speaker in. It was qu quite a thing. I've never seen anything like it. But they brought these great speakers in. And I realized that I could pick the people I wanted to learn from. So I kind of, over the years, as I grew in dentistry, the next you know, envelope of, of knowledge that I needed to learn, I could, you know, actually go and either seek them out in a study club or something like the Newport Harbor Academy. So eventually I moved back to Illinois from California and I started a study club called the Chicago Academy of Interdisciplinary Dental Facial Therapy. And that was started in like 1993. So we've had Pat Allen, we've had uh, Rick Robley, we've had you know, Frank Spear, we've had all the names in dentistry, you know, you could probably think of Peter Worley, um, uh, Bob Winter, Don Cornell, you know, lab technicians, periodontists, orthodontists, we've had them throughout the years at our study club. And at the beginning of it all, it was really who I wanted to learn from next. So it was really me kind of designing my own little learning framework. And so we, but we only had three speakers a year. And the other five, and we would meet uh, eight times during the year, and the other five meetings were a treatment planning uh, session, and essentially it was showing the uh, images of the patient, you know, getting the dental photos, the uh, radiographs, the cast, and describing what the problems were, not giving a treatment plan. Because a, a treatment plan in the sense that you're talking about what you're actually going to do as far as a procedure. Because it's, I, I feel it's really hard to do that without the patient's preference. Um, 
while doing all this, you know, one of the things I came across was Bob, uh, Bob Barkley and uh, kind of got introduced to him through uh, Avram King. And this was way early in my career. I mean, I was probably 29 years old when I started to listen to Avram King tapes and stuff like that. And then when I uh, started my practice, I went into one-on-one -on -one consultation with Avram King. But one of the quotes I, I really like is, the best dentist makes the patient worse at the slowest rate possible. And so my mantra for my practice is that we try to do the least amount of restorative dentistry needed to meet the aesthetic and functional needs of the patient, restore the structural integrity of the tooth to preserve the biologic health, and to offer the treatment based on the patient's preferences to reduce risk so they can have sustainable oral health for a lifetime. And you know, this is kind of a countercultural way to practice, I feel. I don't know a lot of people that truly do this. I, I hear lip service to it. Um, however, everybody knows that you know, when things get tight or thin, you, know, you wanna kind of put production in, you wanna you know, you know, make a sale or something like that. But if your practice is all about that, you really never get to uh, let the patient process through what their problems are and how they may want to manage their problems. And I do feel that patients will make the best choice for themselves based on their set of circumstances if you allow them to. And, um, you know, basically individual and culture, this was uh, Joseph Campbell and the power of myth. And sometimes when you're trying to go against the culture, you know, you really, it's kind of a lonely road. And so in this model that Joseph Campbell talks about with, um, he looked at different uh, cultures and different religions and essentially there's an area that is in most cultures that you have these different kind of like uh, carvings or Sanskrit paintings and different things that represent the culture. So everything within that ring is what's known in the culture. And then what happens with the uh, hero's journey, he gets tapped on the shoulder when he's in that culture. And it's kind of like somebody says to him, is there enough for you here? And so the hero has to kind of leave the culture, okay? And there you are kind of in shell shock when this happens. And so you're gonna go out into the abyss, out beyond that ring of the culture, and a portal opens up and you go. And you know, there's a whole bunch of consequences that happen if you don't go, kind of a dying of self if you don't go. But if you go, there's this journey that you go on. And outside in the abyss are these sort of loathy creatures that you come across. You don't know who really uh, has your well-being or, or, you know, who's kind of like there to help you or hurt you. You have to kind of, you know, use your heart to figure it out, kind of the Star Wars um, model of things. And that was really, um, you know, the whole Star Wars was kind of based on Joseph Campbell's uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And so, you know, basically the you go out and you discover what you need to know, and then you have to bring it back to the culture, okay? And when you come back to the culture, nobody's really <laughs> looking at it with open arms. And, and typically what you find, when you, what the hero finds is something that either was not known to the culture or was forgot about with the culture. And I think that, you know, in dentistry, I think kind of, especially with all the technological aspects, so much tech, technological hype, okay, that's out there, we forget about the human element and we forget about the, the, uh, the dentist processing this information. If you have trained yourself, you know, and we're kind of like, you know, in a way self programming cytoplasmic robots, taking information in. And if you've done it, you know, with integrity from the very beginning, it becomes a habit. And, um, you know, I don't know that artificial intelligence can really do that the way people can. And, I think that you know when you come back into the culture to try to practice dentistry authentically and not hype a technology or not hype you know this next consultant's way of making a buck or you know how many procedures can I do, but really try to help the patient understand based on what you know uh, how they can maintain their oral health and manage it for a lifetime. So. You know, for me, trying to do that has really been kind of the way to follow my bliss in the profession, even though, you know, it may not, there may be more profitable ways or more, you know, lucrative ways to practice, you know, helping people get oral health and, and, and get what they want so they can manage it for their lifetime is really kind of what fulfills me. So, for example, if someone has some crowding with their teeth and they're in their 20s or, 
you know, even 30s, and their teeth are relatively healthy, but just have a little bit of wear and things like this, I would much rather see that patient go through some orthodontics, get things in the proper position, set things up correctly for the rest of their life, you know, as far as gingival levels, digital architecture, that kind of display of the teeth, and then also the function to distribute force in the teeth uh, favorably, maybe bleach the teeth and just do a little bit of bonding rather than try to put veneers on crooked teeth that make the tooth contours look too narrow and maybe too long and narrow. And now you've got some major dentistry that you have to maintain the rest of your life. And everybody knows that the dentistry is not going to last the rest of their life. But, you know, I feel like if you can get it to last 30 years, that's, that's a pretty good goal. And I feel if things are in the right position with the right spa space appropriation and done with proper labs and things like that, I think that's not an unrealistic goal. So <clears throat> every uh, summer in Chicago, there was the uh, um, uh, Grateful Dead and the Grateful Dead were also kind of, they would come every 4th of July to Chicago and they had met uh, Joseph Campbell and their whole thing was kind of also the whole folly or bliss type of thing. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, this is kind of a lonely road, a path that, you know, not everybody has, you know, traveled. And so I believe that, you know, this kind of practice can be a little bit intimidating, a little bit, a little bit scary to allow the patient to leave the office and process information you've talked about in not only the new patient exam, but, or the new patient consultation, but new patient examination. And then when we've reviewed the diagnostic uh, findings, but I feel like it's kind of like filling a pipeline and things will drop out the other side. You just don't know when and you can't control it. And so that part of not being able to control things, I think is what makes people, you know, sort of run scared and not do it. Meaning dentist. Once you start doing it though, I believe there comes a certain point where there's no return, you know, and this point has to be reached. So this is a picture of me skydiving years ago. And, um, you know, it's kind of like jumping out of the, the, uh, the, the door of the plane when you're skydiving, you know, once you jumped out, you know, there's nothing to do, but do the skydiving and, and, and pull the chute. You know, you gotta, you gotta perform. And until one co is committed, there's hesitancy, the chance to draw back. So it really has to be kind of a personal commitment that I don't want to practice like insurance-based practice. You know, I don't want to practice corporate dental. I want to practice where I actually have a relationship with the patient where I help them, you know, and they have to also be committed to wanting to have oral health. And I think the best, you know, the best approach with patients um, trying to have that kind of oral health for a lifetime is to really say, you know, what's the least I can do to give this patient, you know, the aesthetics, the function, uh, restore the structure, integrity, improve through the biologic health. What's the, the least amount that I have to do to attain that for this particular patient? And that has to do then with the spirit of your practice. This was a drawing we actually did about our practice. What was important to our practice? We did this uh, with a consultant named Alt Brower who had worked with Avram King for a long time. And when Avram died, he was doing dental consulting. But, you know, for us in my practice, learning is a uh, important aspect. So every bit of these little tentacles coming off of this uh, sun or whatever, fireball, um, you know, we want to have joy. We want excellence. We want a sacred space when we're working with a patient. You know, we want that sacred space where people aren't interrupting you and everything else. It's just about helping that patient uh, attain health. Uh, trust, you know, service. There's all these different aspects. We want to be profitable, of course, you know, but all these aspects are important to me in the practice. And the people that are around me need to have that or there's not uh, any kind of integrity in the office, you know, it ends up becoming dissidents and someone's got a different sort of uh, mindset. Okay, so my job, uh, my position with Dr. Vincent is um, I'm the treatment coordinator, basically. And it is the best job in the world, I love it. I, uh, I was a hygienist and still am for 40 years. And I just in the last five or six years moved into this role and basically, co-discovery, co-diagnosis becomes a culture. It becomes a culture in the office. 
it's a culture that um, you become immersed in. Um, it's such a valuable tool. It's a tool that I use with my family, with my children, with your comings and goings with other people. And I think at the end of this seminar, you'll see why. I mean, basically, um, with co-discovery, you're opening the door to all possibilities. You're teaching people to, ex to explore. Um, you're thinking out of the box. Um, and you're helping us through this process. And during that time frame, um, and this is a great quote, all I needed to know in life I learned through co-discovery, imagination is more important than knowledge. We all have a lot of knowledge, whether we, use, whether we just use that in a very finite way, in a very closed box way, or if we take that knowledge and we allow ourselves to expand our mind is a, is a, into a whole new world is huge. Um, for knowledge is limited, uh, to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world, all and all there ever will be to know and understand. And basically, there's another quote by Einstein. For a while, I was very involved with, I, did, I taught art programs to children after school, and um, um, this quote by Einstein said, if you want your child to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. So what we do in effect with uh, patients too is we just, we do a lot of questioning, we do a lot of um, investigating, and we let them explore what might be a possibility for them, and it might not. But in the end, my biggest regret in interviewing patients is when they come in and they, you know, we'll talk about treatment options um, and they'll say, you know, I wish somebody would have told me that years ago. I might not have chosen that option, but I would have loved to have known that it existed. So we open up a realm of possibilities for patients to discover if that's where they want to go or not. Um, pathway to essential meaningful treatment and this is this is how our patient flow goes our new patient uh, flow generally that comes into the office sometimes with our with patients that have been patients of record we might go back and we might need to revisit and go through this process this might be very valuable to them I believe dr. Sheldon is going to provide this uh, patient flow to you um, after the seminar, and, and I think it's something that would be very valuable to you. If there's one or two nuggets of, uh, of just valuable information that you take from the seminar, that's going to be huge. I would say, and, and as I go through these, this process, um, I want you to really focus on the, on the is initial consultation process because there's nothing that's more valuable in our practice than that initial consultation. Basically, when a patient calls, um, whoever answers the phone, whether it's office manager, one of the clinical coordinators, we do a telephone consultation that just, you know, we want to know how, how, why they want to come to our practice, how we can help them, possibly who referred them. Um, you know, we're going to let them know a very, we want to know more about them. And at this point, we're going to bring them into the practice, let them know that what we do is we start with an initial new patient consult um, and and then we get just a very limited amount of information from them them send them off our registration forms our medical forms let them know that it's really important for them to come into our practice to make sure it's a good fit that they're comfortable let them know that we want them to meet dr. Vince in in a consultation room setting first before they're lying prone in a chair and he comes into the room and he says, hi, I'm your new dentist or I'm a dentist. So we want it to be a really comfortable atmosphere for them in a very non-threatening way in an area that they're not going to be vulnerable. Um, we also let them know we, our new patient consults. We do those pro bono and we spend a lot of time with patients interviewing them and finding out how we can help them. Um, and basically, Dr. Vince has done this for decades. We have a new patient consult a questionnaire that I so I'm basically doing an interview with them asking them again how can we help you you know why did you seek us out um, generally the number one how we can help them may not be the real reason that they're there but they tell us that uh, the second question is do you have any other concerns at this time and we find with a lot of patients it's really that second or third concern 
they're a little bit maybe shy um, about telling, or maybe they don't even know why they're really there. So those follow-up questions are really important with this consult. We ask them, well, how do you think this happened? Um, you know, maybe they've got some fractured teeth is why they're there and to ask them why it happened it's really interesting it, it's like well it's because my mom and dad had bad teeth and they lost their teeth and um or it's because of x y and z but that gives us a huge insight into why into their family of origin why they think that they're there um you know what their perception of the problem is and this is another extremely important piece of the puzzle for us because it helps us to understand where they're coming from um, versus right away sometimes um, you know in practices patient comes in with a fractured tooth and we right away jump to the conclusion we want to know what they think the problem is we want to know what their family um, thinks about the problem we want to know what a sex satisfactory outcome would be for them what their previous experience has been in dentistry um, as far as their health history, what do they, how do they feel about their health? How do they feel about their dental health? Um, um, and that's a big part of it because as you know, we're looking at the big picture. We're looking at wellness. We're looking at sustainable oral health for a lifetime. And that all fits in there. We want to know what's their time. Do they have a time frame in mind? Um, what's difficult for them? What would stop them from seeking treatment? In one case, one interview I did, it was a, a young, young corporate um, gal, and she'd been away from dentistry for 10 years. She was from Oklahoma. She grew up in a, a middle to upper income family, had always gone to the dentist, and they said, wow, you've had dental insurance. Um, she was, was married, had a, had a young child now, and I said, well, what kept you away? It wasn't the means, and she said, you know, when I went to the dentist, when I went to the hygienist, when I had my cleanings, I always felt shamed about not flossing and she said believe it or not that was part of the reason i just i just really hated going to the dentist so i mean just that little piece of information that shaming and i think there were some other things that were going on too but that was a huge piece of the puzzle that came out through our initial consultation um, from at that initial consultation um, i will do the interview dr vince will come in and and uh, get to meet the patient and i'll give them the cliff notes um, and so in the, and after that point, I'll, you know, kind of talk to the patient. I'll say, did I explain that? You know, did I, did I give those, um, you know, that information to him um, as you thought you conveyed it to me? And, you know, sometimes I did in active listening and sometimes the patient will say, you know, what I really meant was this. So anyway, at that point, they're really feeling listened to and really, we're really getting a piece into their family of origin, how they feel the problem um, happened, what they feel would be a good fix for the problem and a satisfactory outcome. And in so many ways, ways patients are so intuitive, they, they come in and they've already diagnosed some of the problems just by this interview. So they feel heard, um, the diagnostic services, depending on what would be appropriate for them, we will go into what we call new patient one and two. New patient one would be comprehensive exam, x-rays if it's appropriate, photos. Photos are our most important diagnostic tool. And that's um, because people are visual learners. That's, um, I, I can't say enough. If you, you don't have to have a fancy camera, you can have, you can get a little intraoral camera from Amazon for a few hundred dollars. There's nothing that I would, um, that I would stress more than you using patient's photos to help them discover, um, you know, what we're seeing otherwise you're solving problems for them that they don't know they have in many cases new patient two if patients need to go on to that would be diagnostic casts um, occlusal analysis and then from there after we've gathered all the appropriate diagnostics we come back to a treatment planning session and that's where we sit down with the patients and we look at the photos and we might bring them up on screen and we'll ask them what do you see we're not gonna tell them because we wanna know, we wanna look through their, their issues, we wanna look through their mouth, uh, we wanna look through their photos through their eyes, not from what we see. And However, so, we, do, we do have the pictures in a certain order yes. where we start aesthetically with the face, then the smile, then we kinda of go in intraorally and 
uh, show more kind of like how the occlusion is and the posterior teeth and the occlusal views. So there is a way that we are kind of leading them through how we look at things, but we let them identify the issues and it's uncanny how well they identify the problems that we see too. Rarely do they miss the problem. And, um, and I mean, really for us, they, it's just, it's an amazing awareness for both parties. We don't spend a lot of time reviewing the photos other than Dr. putting them in a keynote of the, you know, an appropriate order. And um, it just, it's so, it's so freeing for that patient to see, you know, to see X, Y, and Z um, from that appointment. We're going to go in, it, it may, we may start the treatment planning or we will start, you know, treatment planning in that we're going to ask them what they see, what they want to address, what they like about their smile, what they might like to change about their smile. From that process, we may start to, become, to form a treatment plan. We may have them come back another time to look at photos again. It, it really depends on what's going on with their mouth. It really depends on what's going on in their life. And, and what we're doing is really peeling the onion and what's going on in their mouth has a lot more to do about what's happened in their life than they realize, than a lot of practitioners realize. So we spend a lot of time going um, from this possibly to obtaining a future choice to a pre treatment planning session. We may bounce back and forth based on where they're feeling in the process. It, it might be a patient that just needs a crown. It might be a patient that is just a hygiene patient. Um, it doesn't have to be complex dental cases. And it's so valuable because at this point, you've made that connection with the patient and you've let them know that you care about where they're at, you care about what they want to have done. And we start to discover if there's some denial or um, you know, some obsessive behavior. It's really such an interesting process and, and um, this, is, this is a great way to start our relationship with them. Um, so the um, obtaining a future of choice, you know, that really is, you know, with the treatment planning session, we identify the problems aesthetically, functionally, structurally, biologically. Obtaining a future of choice, we're talking about how do they want to reduce their risk. And, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, uh, this patient had a poor, low dental IQ. And meaning that they didn't, you know, agree to your treatment plan of what you wanted to to do. I think that that's not really a way I look at things. Um, what I want to do is I want to understand what is their view of what it means to be a dentist because it's been based on their past dental experiences. I wasn't part of that. And I want to try to form a link between what they believe and what we know biomedically. And that's to me the easiest way to form that bridge and accept them for what they want. Um, accept them for what they want builds trust and and then you have the ability then when you form that bridge to help them understand some of the things that you might see that they could lower the risk further so we'll we're going to end up going through some of these photos with a patient we're going to come through a particular patient as we go on into the night here um with the photos and kind of you will Talk, we actually have the questions that we ask on this patient too, so you can see what the actual initial consultation was for that patient. Um, but the obtaining a future of choice, you know, has to do with then almost a negotiation of, of how they want to reduce the risk and what they want to have in terms of time, money, energy, and the outcome they're looking for. And this to me is really where we set uh, realistic and unrealistic expectations. You know, sometimes I just have to tell a patient, you know, that, you know, that's just an unrealistic expectation. You know, you, uh, I had a patient that had, uh, was going to have a four unit bridge from another dentist from uh, seven to 10, missing the two central incisors. And when they were uh, making post space, they perforated the root of one of the laterals and it collapsed the ridge in. And so it doesn't look the same as it used to. It doesn't look the same as the other side. And he just wants to get it back to have how it used to look. And I thought if I took the hook on that one, I would be in a lot of trouble through this case. So it, it had to come to the point where I said, I think that that's just an unrealistic expectation. We will make it look as best we can, but unfortunately you have a loss that you may not get back. And, you know, I do think that 
in a way he appreciated that. I think it built trust because I wasn't telling him something that couldn't be attained. And it also uh, got us off the hook a little bit for, you know, this idea of perfection that in some of these cases is really difficult to attain, even though we can do pretty good. So then the action plan, like Lynn was saying, ends up, you know, laying out the phases of treatment. So we're going to go on to a patient um, in a little bit here, and we'll talk about that. But um, I think that uh, Lynn's got a little bit more to say about some of these tools of communication. Okay. So the key is, it's, it's like two people see an accident. One sees it completely different than another person sees it, but in their mind, that's reality. Okay, so that's why we spend the time on this new patient interview to really end the treatment planning session and um, you know, talking to them about obtaining a future choice because we're all looking through different lens. So it's a matter of if, if you put on your friend's bifocals and they're putting on your, you know, your long vision glasses, you're, see, you're looking at the same thing, but you're seeing it very differently. And that's the biggest thing in communication is they're seeing things differently and maybe we're not exactly communicating that to each other. So that's communication is so important. Um, we like to create visual triggers. Um, probably, you know, the, the photos are great. And also we like to, instead of, Sorry. oh, that's okay. That's okay. Just to, instead of talking about things, um, you know, visual triggers are going to be huge. We're not conquering the mountain. It's not the mountain we're conquering. It's ourselves and people's futures are filtered through their past. So that's why we want to know what, it, you know, what, how, how did your parents um, feel about dentistry? What was your past experience? And as practitioners, as providers, sometimes it's our own biases that we have to get over. So that's the mountain that we have to conquer. And creating a visual triggers, again, if a patient sees it, I, I've had patients tell me that all the, the time. They'll say, they'll look at their photos and they'll say, you know what? Wow, a picture's worth a thousand words. I don't have to say anything. I don't have to try to to get them to treat a problem they didn't even know that they had. So uh, the next, uh, it's a little video clip I think that I have in here of Lynn actually speaking with a patient where she didn't know I was filming her, but this is kind of the space she's in when she's speaking with the, pa the patient. Let's see if it comes up. So she's talking about the, um, you know, just kind of the act of listening and then you see her head turn right there when she sees that I'm videotaping her. Oh. <laughs> it's like, huh. But uh, that's the kind of the space she's in doing it. So the tools for communication, again, when we're asking them, how can we help you? What problem are we really solving? You know, wh why are they going to be doing dentistry? It's really important. When you're, prov when you're talking with the patient, be simple and engaging. Research has shown if you use one technical term, and we do this all the time, we talk about the maxillary arch, we talk about the mandibular arch, um, you know, maxillary upper, or mandibular lower. Patients tend to, people in general, if you go and you listen to a speech and a speaker uses a word that you don't understand it is, your brain automatically goes to that word and they've not, you, you will lose a lot of the explanation or, you know, the discussion that you're having. So, Avoid infobesity. Use simple, engaging terms. Metaphors are huge. Dr. Vince uses it all the time. He's like, when people talk about, we had a patient who was a, she's a, a pancreatic, um, she's a surgeon. And she said, well, I want, my, I want my maxillary, I want veneers on the top, and I want veneers on the bottom. And he said, you know, we can do veneers on the top, but the veneers on the bottom is not going to be a good option for you because the teeth are not in the right position. So we said, you know, if your car, if you have to align your car before you put the tires on, if you don't do that, the tires are going to wear unevenly. So the teeth have to be in the right position first before we address that. So right away, that was huge. And so we use, um, we use terms like that all the time, talking to patients about when they have an extraction, why do they have to have a graft? So, you know, we talk about, I'm like, well, if you pull a bush out of your yard, what happens? Well, the ground collapses. What does that ground look like six months, a year from now? Well, it looks like a hole, even though I filled it in with dirt. 
gra extractions are like that. You have to, if you want, if you don't want that area to collapse and that's up to you, you're going to have to fill in that space. So just things like that we use all the time and, and that's crystal clear for patients. Um, and when patients, okay, and this is something, you know, we've, we're talking about more recently than we did be past, in the past. Do you pass the eyebrow test? So if that patient eyebrow, eyebrow is going up, they're starting to question something, that's a really good thing because then they haven't gone right to how much it's gonna, is it going to cost. They're going into questions. We always like patients to be more in the right hemisphere because they're thinking, they're imagining, they're thinking about options. If, they, if they're sitting down and they're saying, how much is that crown going to cost me? How much is that tooth going to cost me? You want to get them out of the left logical side and get into the right brain side so they can start to imagine or start to think about options before they need to go back to the left side. No, um, nobody wants to buy a crown, but everybody wants, but most people are okay paying for health. Right. So when patients are asking about how much is this going to cost, and, and that's, a, you know, that, that's a very valid question that they have to address, but Dr. Vince will say, okay, you know, you want to redo your kitchen? I don't know. Are, are we going to put in quartz countertops? Are we going to put in laminate countertops? Are we going to put in a sub-zero refrigerator? Are we going to put in a white you know, freezer on top refrigerator? So these are, you know, we have to kind of figure out where they want to go first before we go there. And we want them to ask a lot of questions. So the eyebrow, eyebrow test is great. Okay, tools for communication. These are team tools. When people come into our practice, we prejudge them whether we know it or not, based on maybe the car they drive, the clothes they're wearing, the shoes that they are wearing, you know, what their dialect is. So avoid water cooler talk that, oh, I think this and I think that. We want to sit back and we want to see what, what the patient, you know, thinks or what the patient wants. And team tools, we want to, we just want to be open-minded. We want to, you know, when patients are asking us or telling us something, have open-ended questions. So when they say, well, I'd like to do this, say yes, and get more information um, with the patient. Well, you want to do this. What if we did that? Um, so try to always, always ask open-ended questions and, and be very open. And the other thing is staying in the question, you know, staying in the question with the patient, whatever question they have, you know, asking them, tell me more about that, you know, well, and kind of keep that, uh, that, thread that you're pulling, you know, unraveling what the issues are for the patient. These are the clinical photos and, you know, Lynn goes through these clinical photos oftentimes while I'm there. And these are the pictures that we look at. This is the set of photos that we present to every patient. So we look at the full face, the profile, um, the close up smile, repose, uh, the same magnification that we use for the smile shots, we use for the lips retracted, um, and then shade shots. And then we use down the side mirror shots to show the posterior occlusion uh, with the teeth together and then the teeth apart. The teeth apart will show things like wear or disharmonies between the posterior occlusal plane and the incisal plane. And then straight on occlusal shots that can then let us talk about the different restorations that are in the mouth. And this is, I think, a big eye-opener for most patients. I think this is one of our most important, one of our most valuable tools, actually. And um, what I will do, too, is certain pictures that it's, it's going to be very helpful for them. I always, I always tell them, I'm like, you know, why don't you take some home and why don't you brew on this, you know, come up with some questions, come back and see us, and I will send home, you know, if there's a shot that's appropriate or that's very... Um, enlightening for them, I will print it off and I will send it home with them. And it is huge. Or sometimes I'll send a thumb drive home because it's their diagnostics, especially if they're, they're things that they want to talk over with their families. Um, that I think this is just a great tool for them. Yeah, and we also invite significant others to come, uh, you know, either to the treatment planning session or the obtaining a future of choice. The obtaining a future of choice is a really a good one to have the significant other come in after they have, after the patient has seen some of the diagnostic issues, the first appointment, we can then re, you know, kind of recap that with the significant other and the patient again, so that they can help as a sounding board to help that patient decide 
what they want for themselves. And they can also realize that we're not just trying to sell them dentistry. We're trying to help them determine how they want to progress to maintain their oral health for their lifetime. And in so many cases with those patients too, we'll sit back and say, well, what about this? What? Sometimes they'll diagnose more things than we think are actually there. But um, yeah, it's great. Uh, tools for communication. You know, here's the thing. When we've done some lectures in the past, Dennis will come up to Dr. Vince and say, you know what, I just don't have these type of complex cases. Well, we do everything from soup to nuts. And sometimes it's just a matter of seeing the fish in front of you. And where this came from was a friend of ours has a great little cottage up in Lake Geneva. He never, you know, he's fishing on, on the lake and just wasn't catching a lot. So he hired a guide and he said, you know what, I'm going to pay you a lot of money. I want you to help me catch fish. He got in the boat with him. The guy didn't know where he lived, and he ended up pulling in front of the pier that where, um, went, where Wayne lived. And so actually, there's so much opportunity right in front of us for co-discovery with your office staff, with patients that are hygiene patients, where patients that might need a crown here and there. They're, with your family, with your friends, I just, I can't stress enough, just that active listening and you know, just day by day, step by step, just see what's around you that you can help to build on this culture. The Emperor's New Clothes. We see a lot of patients that um, they've come from a multitude of practices and there's a big issue, as a lot of people know, with abandonment. And sometimes we feel like maybe people were afraid to talk to them about things because they, there was an abandonment issue or maybe there were other issues or they thought the patient couldn't afford it. Um, or they didn't really understand where the patient was coming from. So be that outlier, be the outlier that with the patient identifies problems and talks to them about how do they want to handle it. We tell patients all the time, no, no, not, treating, um, not treating a case or not treating a situation is still a treatment option and that's okay, but it's important to know where they're at and to know where they're coming from. Um, embrace the chaos. Things, as you know, if you're in practice, things don't always go, in many cases, in a logical manner. Embrace the chaos. We have really sometimes difficult cases or difficult patients. Embrace that as an opportunity to learn and to grow. Um, we, we try to break down silos of communication. I'm sure you've all experienced where with a patient, at the end of the day, one staff member will say, oh yeah, well, X, Y, and Z. And there's so many silos of communication in so many businesses in the world today. If we break down those silos of communication, communicate effectively, we would be so much better off and we, we could do our job so much better. Innovation happens in cycles. As doctor said, it's not always a straight line. The patient is not going to come in, have a treatment planning session, have a treatment plan presented to them and start treatment right away. It happens in cycles. You have to be comfortable with the process and um, knowing that that crown might happen next week, but it might not happen for six months because that patient has to process that. But again, if you're continually filling the pipeline and if you believe it and if you live it, you will get that trust and that connection with the patient and it will happen. You're standing on the shoulder of giants for us. Bob Barkley is a huge, and you know, there's there's other mentors that Dr. Vince have learned has learned from um, in the past. And you know, knowing that you're building your foundation of your practice on people that have been there, that have done that, that have a, a great deal of resource to offer you. And you know, these silos of communication, um, you know, it's really interesting that. You know, in medical, there's so many different silos, you know, the different specialties of medicine, and they don't always talk to each other. We do it fairly well in dentistry with interdisciplinary approaches, but even us, um, we really have to keep on the specialists, uh, the orthodontists in particular, to kind of keep the communication of where they're at in treatment. So this isn't only in the office that these little silos end up happening. It actually happens between our offices. So you know, that's one of the reasons why I, um, you know, when I first met Lynn, I just thought, wow, she'd be a great treatment coordinator because she seemed like such a great communicator and had a good passion for dentistry and everything, and a lot of knowledge. And, and I thought she'd be a great person for, for, 
to, to have the communication between the specialist um, facilitated. And sometimes it's hard. I mean, sometimes the, the, the different offices just, you know, they just aren't used to communicating with other offices. They get in their own little world, they do their thing. And then when they're done, um, they will send them back the done, but there's not been communication leading up to that. And so, you know, the more we can communicate between our specialty offices, um, the more we might be able to anticipate, okay, this patient's going to be finishing ortho or, the, or you know, in, in six weeks, and then they're going to be ready for some transitional restorations. Or this patient's going to be having an implant placed, and, you know, and that could have been done before the end of ortho if there was enough space for an implant. And so that when the uh, ortho was finished, they'd have to wait another three months to have the implant healed. It, that could have been coupled together. So the more we can communicate, the more we can shorten treatment times for patients where it doesn't compromise care, just lets things overlap in a logical way. And that's really important because when we start this process with patients, there is a, uh, we kind of build emotional currency. It's kind of like filling the bank up with, you know, excitement and, you know, some you know, and we want to fill it up with realistic expectations because if it's unrealistic expectation, that depletes the emotional currency. So we want to fill that bank up with realistic expectations of what's going to happen in treatment. But if things drag out, that emotional currency gets depleted. By the time they get around to me to start the restorative, they may be sick of treatment. So communicating, try to like leverage the treatment so we can shorten treatment times um, is extremely important in having a successful experience for that patient because the, the, the successful experience is not just the outcome we get at the end it's how they felt about getting to that outcome i think the other aspect of that and you made a good point is com with the communication so basically i'm a treatment coordinator and i'm lucky enough that's primarily my sole responsibility or my sole function but it can be anybody it can be your office manager your hygienist your assistant but when we give a referral card to a patient from the endodontist, we have great periodontists right downstairs from us. I will, I'm like, hey, come on in the consult room. Can I call for you? And for some people, the reason treatment doesn't go forward is because they hate calling. Um, my husband is an IT. Calling someone for a doctor's appointment is the toughest job he does all day long. So I will gladly facilitate the appointment. I will help them out. I will make the appointment. Some people, you know, necessarily don't want to do that, but if I, as a case concierge, I tell them, I'm like, I'm an advocate for you, and you let me know if you're having a problem with this or if you have a concern with this, and that's one thing also. If you're working with specialists, I mean, even somebody just, a tooth that just needs to have a tooth evaluated for endodontic therapy, if you can call for them, they know that you're behind them, that you care about the, their health and their dentistry. So I, we're a huge, Dr. Vince is a huge advocate of, let's take care of this today, let's help them with the appointment or help them in any way we can. And there again, that's a communication factor. When you call that specialist, they know that it's important and they'll probably get that patient in in a more timely manner as well. And then, you know, the, the communication also can be a positive synergistic thing as well when it's done correctly. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, working with Alan Rosenfeld over the years that we've sat down with patients after we've gathered the diagnostic information and we kind of are at that obtaining a future of choice, we may have an IDT consultation with the specialist. And, and then the synergy that happens between specialists advocating for each other and for that patient um, really kind of, you know, builds authentic trust because it's not made up stuff. We've had an experience working with each other and, you know, I mean, I have the utmost respect for Alan and George Mandelaris and Brad DeGroote, the paradox I work with. And, um, you know, so I can say, hey, these guys are the best it gets, you know, and, and, and mean it. So this is something for me, just awareness, awareness of what's going on with the patient. You know, again, with Dr. Vince, I mentioned the one patient that had unrealistic expectations to just kind of sit back and say, oh, I kind of see this could be an issue. We really need to talk about this. Um, we have a lot of knowledge, but we, we're not always wise about our knowledge. So, um, and again, citing that patient who had been shamed by the hygienist, you know, it's like, okay, I, I see this an issue. I'm going to go talk to the hygienist and let him know. This is a, a big vulnerable area for that patient. Sometimes it's the courage to do something that we need to do. Again, 
you know, in letting a patient know this is the situation, this, you know, let's sit down, let's talk about it, let's look at this together. And sometimes it takes a great deal of courage because that can become an abandonment issue. You want to talk a little bit about Tina? Yeah, Tina was a, a patient that was, um, through circumstances in her life, had virtually um, become a recluse, and she just uh, had become a dental handicap, and and uh, she got to the point that she was, um, it, it had really become an emotional thing, and it was controlling her life. Her, her sister, I think, had had uh, passed away. Um, I think it was an accident or something. Her and sister she, was a was it like like an like an adventure mountain climber that would take people up m climbing mountains and things like that. And uh, and so you know she was really kind of the opposite of Tina. And Tina was you know when her sister died, she didn't want that. Um, she kind of wanted to carry the torch of being more adventuresome. So that was one of the motivations for her then to do something about her teeth because she was having issues uh, with her teeth and the appearance and also the function. So, so she's, she, yeah, she, she ended up, she ends up, you can see this is uh, Alan Rosenfeld watching George and, and uh, they're in there doing the uh, uh, placement of implants and things like this. So this is a nice little surgery center that they have downstairs of us. It's actually like a little mini, it's like an operating room, but it, I think because it's got tile roof, it's, more a surgery center technically, but it's a huge space. It's very safe. I mean, I have nothing but the utmost trust when these guys go to do their procedures. So, you know, here, here's a fellow that comes to the practice and, you know, really uh, he has, uh, you know, income isn't the issue. You know, money's not the problem for treatment. It's what to do about this case. And this patient had an Essex appliance because he had a bridge that eventually broke off. And you can see the wear, the attrition and erosion on these teeth and the loss of vertical posteriorly. And eventually those thicker incisal edges as the teeth, you know, erupted uh, to compensate, you know, for the wear became more of a wedge in the anterior and he snapped the, the, the you know, the uh, teeth off right at the gingival levels. So, you know, what do you do about that? There's no room to restore that. And so some of the options with this patient would be to maybe take all the teeth out and do an all on four, all on six case. Um, other option, uh, you know, you know, you really can't get in there with even a partial, you know? So, you know, you could maybe open them up, but when you open up someone's uh, vertical dimension like this, um, a lot of times that jaw falls back and now you've got a problem with the uh, mutually protected occlusion and that anterior articulation, you got a space there. So, you know, there's a lot of issues of what to do. And so we ended up doing surgically facilitated orthodontic therapy to change that anterior protected articulation, place a couple implants. We actually saved those teeth that were broken off. So the canine on the right and the two centrals are actually the, uh, the, teeth that, the tooth that broke off. We were going to keep those teeth, just develop an implant site so we could do a four unit bridge there from canine to the, uh, from the right canine to the left central. But um, we decided after we had extruded the teeth and gotten a feral effect and all that, that we were going to go ahead and just keep them as long as we could and have a little proprioception. So he has an implant in the site of number seven, and then he had two previous implants that were already in that, um, you know, pre-op situation in uh, 10 and 11 that were placed years and years ago. Those were like Branamark implants with a hex top. So UCLA abutments and that type of thing. So, you know, even though the gingival uh, tissues, you know, don't have the exact harmony we would maybe ideally like, he wasn't a person that showed his gum. And I thought that the proprioception of those teeth was important. So this is how he ended up. But one of the questions he asked me was, you know, once he got the treatment plan, he said, you know, an all on four case, all on six case, upper and lower would be about half the cost of keeping these teeth. So why would I want to keep these teeth? And I said, that, well, that's a great question. You know, I go, he goes, would you do this? You know, and I said, well, I don't know if I could afford it, but thankfully I don't have to afford it. The guy that makes the Ferrari doesn't have to be able to afford the Ferrari. But, uh, you know, I said, there's uh, three meanings for teeth in dreams, according to Carl Jung. One is ornamental, another is utilitarian, and the, and the third is a sense of personal power. Um, 
everybody kind of maybe has heard, you know, with like Under Armour and stuff, they have those mouthpieces that give you a better bite and you can bench more, you know, that sense of biting your teeth together and that, that sense of proprioception and personal power is important, but you don't really get that with implants and you don't get it with a denture. And so, um, I said a denture is kind of ornamental, you know, and you could just do a denture. That'd be the least expensive. You know, all on four, all on six cases would be something that would be utilitarian, but you'd, you wouldn't have the proprioception. How important that proprioception is, I don't know, because I've never had all my teeth taken out and implants put in. But I could imagine it would maybe be something that I would want to have if I could afford it. And so, um, you, know, you know, once you take the teeth out, you can't put them back. So ultimately he decided that he wanted to move ahead and try to keep the teeth. And I think it was a good decision because I think we're probably seven years out without problems with Don at this point. So co-discovery, um, we want to basically take, you know, in that obtaining a future choice, we want to take the patient's view of dentistry and our biomedical view. And we want to bring them, we want to shine light on that for the patient um, and try to bring those two things together. <clears throat> Oftentimes we talk about patient education. Um, I think that it's more important to form a bridge to what they already know. Um, you know, you know, when someone says they, they've got a poor dental IQ, it means that their belief system is different than our belief system. Watch your word, watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habit. Watch your habits, they become belief. Watch your beliefs, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. So if you look at this, thoughts and belief, or words and beliefs, Beliefs are pretty far away from words. You have to go through a lot of experiences before you really get a belief. It's very difficult to change someone's beliefs with our words in that short period of time that we're even within a year or two years. So I believe it's more important to find out what they believe and then try to form a bridge to what we know as best we can. The other thing is uh, walls and inauthenticity and then roles and technology. So you know, you think of the Wizard of Oz, you know, and, the, and, you know, when they go to meet Oz, he's behind the curtain, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I'm Oz. And I think a lot of times we try to do that in our dentistry. We, we have, you know, more and more technological things, more computers, we have imaging stuff, we have DSD, we have, you know, scans of teeth, we have, you know, this is what you could look like, you know, but we're not really finding out what they want. And, and we're also being inauthentic. You know, we put our white coat on, we tie our tie up a little tighter to look more perfect, you know? And I think we need to kind of, you know, get out of the robot and then just be the, sh be the person helping like the shaman on the left-hand side of the screen, be, be the person that's trying to help that person attain the level of health that they want and integrate them into their culture and their, and their family and lifestyle so that the oral health isn't a problem. And, for so many older people, my mom is 88 years old and really, you know, she's still active, goes to the gym, um, still drives, goes out with her friends, you know, but usually what they're doing has to do with, you know, they might go to a play and then dinner, you know, they might go to the symphony and then dinner, you know, so they, they're always doing something with dinner and chewing and eating. And when someone doesn't have that when they're older, they end up just kind of getting alone and isolated, not as social anymore, and it affects their overall health. So I feel like we really have to help patients in their 50s and 60s, or hopefully even younger, not even get to a place where they have to do a lot in their 50s and 60s, but help them get to a point where their dentistry is finished by the time they retire. They're, they're, they're not having to do a lot of dentistry in retirement, because in retirement, you know, they may not be as, uh, you know, likely to spend the money to maintain their, you know, to, to do any major dentistry. So any major dentistry needs to be done earlier. Uh, the doctor must remove the mask for the patient to remove the mask. We have to be real with our patients and not try to be, you know, like this, like professional that's kind of using the power to kind of manipulate. That doesn't work to help patients, you know, feel comfortable to listen and learn about what their issues are and what the true ideology of the problems can be. So be authentic. And the patients make the best decision for themselves based on their unique set of circumstances. We need to accept the patient for what they want and that creates safety and trust. And, you know, 
the best thing to do is not try to create safety and trust. You know, the best thing to do is to be trustworthy. A mutual and reciprocal relationship. You be that, you don't try to create it. And you don't have to treat the patient. You know, you can accept somebody for what they want. And you can say, I understand what you want. I don't know if I could be successful doing that. Um, you know, so, you know, part friends. <clears throat> a doctor helps patient develop a narrative around treatment. So, you know, what does it mean to him to go through this treatment? You know, that's an important thing to kind of, you know, have because it can help you through the sticky parts of treatment with patients, especially in these longer lasting treatment plans. And like Morton Amsterdam said, there's one correct diagnosis, <clears throat> but the ideal treatment is what is ideal for the patient. Okay. There's many ways to skin a cat. So let's take a look here at John, all right? And so John comes to us, and we're going to go through a, um, this patient, and we're going to kind of, you know, use what we talked about with the co-discovery process, and we're going to talk about how we gather the information and the photos and everything. So um, the first thing that's going to come up, I think, is this question, the questions, and these are the questions that we ask the patient in the intake interview, uh, the new patient interview, not the telephone consult, but the new patient interview. And the first question we ask, or the, I, I don't ask this question anymore, uh, Lynn asked this, but what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out what the patient's view of dentistry is, okay? So these were the actual questions that were asked and then the answers. So Lynn would say, how may I help you? And John said, Lynn. I was, I'm sorry to adjust my screen so I can read it. Um, he was unhappy with how his teeth look doesn't like crowding or the color. Adult teeth came in stained. Had orthodontics in middle school. Lower left recession. Yeah, so we'll see that again in a little bit. I don't wanna go back because I'll have to go through these, all these questions again. But if you remember the lower left canine was stripped down about six millimeters on the facial. So do you have any other concerns at this time? Patient replied, Teeth are prone to decay because he had a lack of enamel. So that was his, that was his thought. Bottom teeth shifting, not compliant with retainer. There was lower graft was done twice and it wasn't staying. And that was the uh, gingival graft that was done on the facial of number 22. What's your belief about how these problems occur? Okay, I guess we got more about them. Wear on teeth, wakes up with jaw pain, another concern. Um, what's your belief about how these problems occur? Graph not staying due to, and you know what? My little frame is over that. <laughs> is it position. Okay, position. Okay. Yeah. What do you feel needs to be done to correct these problems? Um, every dentist says veneers. Yeah, so, you know, that's, I mean, that's, uh, you know, he's been to many dentists and they say veneers. And I don't know how you fix this type of case with veneers. There are huge space appropriation problems, function problems, um, you know, if you did try to fix these teeth with veneers, you'd have problems with the intrinsic portions of the teeth. You could never make the teeth look like natural teeth. What does your family and friends feel needs to be done to address these problems? It's something not applicable, doesn't discuss it. What would you describe as a satisfactory outcome? Great aesthetic, great aesthetics, color, and position. And what were your past dental experiences like? Very tolerant. So those are the questions we get. Now, you know, basically what you'll see here is, the, you know, we're going to go through the treatment planning session. In the treatment planning session, we're going to evaluate the patient aesthetically, functionally, structurally, and biologically. So what we do is when we find the problems in here, we then find out where does the component belong in a dental facial analysis. So I'm going to go through the dental facial analysis quickly that I got from Rick Robley. And then at the end of that, we'll go through the photos aesthetically, functionally, structurally, biologically, and um, the photos and the x-rays and uh, kind of come up with what the problem list would be. So here are the components of a dental facial analysis. Um, what we do with this is we're going to locate the problems within the dental facial components um, after we found them aesthetically, functionally, structurally, biologically. So we'll list them aesthetically and functionally and biologically and structurally and biologically and then we'll locate the problem in the dental facial analysis so here you go this will help us determine who's going to be on the idt team so dental 
has to do with a tooth problem, okay? You've got wear. Periodontal is basically the, where the dental gingival complex is, okay? You know, when you have disease and things like that, you know, everything apical to the dental gingival complex is healthy. Everything coronal, you know, around the dental gingival complex may be diseased, but then you also have situations where you have maybe altered active or altered passive eruption and, and things like this. You have to sort out, is the dental gingival complex in the correct, you know, position on the tooth? And how are you going to manage that? Whether it was from disease or whether it was from altered uh, active eruption. But, you know, we need to have that dental gingival complex frame our tooth so that we have the right length and width of what that tooth should be. Then you can have alveolar problems, you know, cleft uh, palate, which would then affect all the soft tissues and maybe even the tooth. Um, then dental alveolar problems. This is very common with patients that have got orthodontic issues um, and airway issues. But this is where you have deficiencies in dental alveolar bone. Uh, you can kind of picture if someone's got, you know, a high angle mandible and the teeth have super erupted to come into contact, it almost stretches out like saltwater taffy and you get real thin dehiscences, thin bone and dehiscences on the uh, facial uh, or fenestrations on the facial of the uh, roots. And then alveoloskeletal issues where maybe the whole dental alveolar bone is really not in the correct position over the basal bone with a whole segment of dental alveoloskeletal uh, bone could stand to be repositioned over the basal bone. And then finally, uh, skeletal issues where you actually have a true skeletal, you know, uh, relationship that's off. Either jaw to face, which would be the upper jaw to the face, or jaw to jaw relationship. And that involves orthognathic. There's like four components that we think about with that. Jaw to face, jaw to jaw, um, tooth to jaw, are the teeth in the right position within the jaw? And then tooth to tooth, do the teeth come together and articulate properly with the proper occlusion? And the occlusion we're, I'm looking for is a fully, you know, fully seated condylar position. I'm looking for bilateral simultaneous posterior tooth contact in the centric arc occlusion. I want to have an anterior protected articulation where the front teeth protect the back teeth from horizontal wear and load, and the back teeth protect the front teeth from vertical overload. And you know, how can we attain that? And then TMJ, we want to know the position and condition of these teeth, I mean, of this, of this joint, to see if that's going to affect our occlusion and how those come together. Um, airway issues, that could also affect uh, the occlusion. Um, and soft tissue, the overall soft tissue drape. And so if you look at this, you know, if someone's got a dental problem, that's the restorative dentist or prosthodontist. Someone's got a problem with a dental gingival complex, that's the periodontist. Someone's got dental alveolar issues or alveoloskeletal issues. These are like orthodontic problems that are in the gray zone between, and that's what Rick Roby kind of coined that. They're, they're problems that are between traditional orthodontics and orthodontic surgery, where you have issues with, you know, dental alveolar compensations and things like this because of maybe a skeletal mismatch or a slight skeletal mismatch. So dental alveolar problems can be treated by a, I, I feel the best person is a periodontist. I really think periodontists need to think of themselves as um, specialists of the dental alveolar complex, not just the periodontal issues of the dental gingival complex, but everything down to the basal bone. And there is a little bit of overlap because the oral surgeon could also deal with this stuff as well. But the skeletal issue is definitely the person that's the orthognathic surgeon. Uh, Temporomandibular joint problems, as long as they're not going to involve surgery, can be in the realm of the restorative doctor. Um, if they need surgery, then it, obviously you're going to be involving an or, oral surgeon. Um, airway, airway can involve a lot of different people. It could be ENT, could be sleep specialist, um, could be uh, you know someone who's making a oral appliance, someone who's giving them CPAP, and then soft tissue drape. That's oral surgeons, but you know probably plastics is most common. So what we're trying to do when we look at uh, the diagnosis in, of someone's mouth, you know, and I learned this back when I was even working at my dad's denture lab, is where do we want to sit, seat those coronal, the coronal tooth structure in the patient's face? Well, that's an easy thing to do kind of with a, with a denture because you have nothing in your way. That's why you don't want to put in implants and bars and stuff before you've actually figured out where the teeth belong because you don't want that stuff in your way. So if you make a denture first, then you can decide where the implants or bars need to go relative to the ideal tooth position. 
So the denture ends up being, you know, a jaw to face relationship where you put the teeth in the correct position and the coronal tooth structure with denture teeth is not worn. It's the right size and width. So the intrinsic proportion is correct. But the problem we have is when we position, we can do that fairly easily with a denture, but we have natural teeth. We have these pesty little things called roots that have to be positioned and they have to have the dental alveolar bone around them. And sometimes because of the dental alveolar, alveoloskeletal or skeletal issues or a combination of all, you don't have that luxury. You don't have enough dental alveolar bone. And, you know, often in the past we've said, well, we are limited in where we can move the teeth because of the orthodontic walls. And so we would change the shapes of teeth. Well, in reality, the bone is the most plastic structure in the human body. It's the one more, most turnover, most ability to adapt. And we can change the orthodontic walls with SFOT and get the roots in the right position in the patient's face to support the right space to make the form of the coronal tooth structure what it, what it needs to be. There's not a whole lot of variation. Centrals look like centrals. Laterals look like laterals. Canines look like lateral, uh, canines. So we want to make, we, we want to try to figure out what kind of space do we need to make the teeth natural and function properly. So our aesthetic treatment planning, when I'm sitting in a room with Lynn and Lynn has a, uh, a, a sheet where we have our aesthetic issues that we're writing down. It's a, it's, you know, basically an outline and we, we write down, you know, where, where's the central incisor, you know? So we will look at the patient's face overall, look at a profile and we'll try to evaluate, you know, are the, uh, are the pupils lined up with a commissure of the lip? Is there asymmetry to this patient's face? You know, what are the thirds of the patient's face? We write that down in Jeff Rouse's core um, aesthetic evaluation. And, you know, this is on the left-hand screen. This is how we usually look at a patient's face when I was in dental school. I don't know if they changed that, but patient's faces really don't look like this. They're not that symmetrical. And you can see in John's case, the right side of his face is the long side of his face. And I learned this from Walter Gephardt and Conrad Minor back in the 90s, but most patients have a short side of the face and his short side is on his left. And if you were to describe an arc of a compass, the point of the compass would be on his left side of his face out in space over there somewhere and you describe this arc and the, and the bridge of the nose and the midline should be on that arc. If it's not, the midline isn't following that arc, it's going the other way or it's straight up and down like you were trying to make the patient look like perfectly symmetrical on the left, uh, left hand side of the screen, um, you'll end up having that, those teeth look like they're going against the patient's grain of their face. Well, the other thing is if you notice his lips, they're not straight. You know, they're going up higher on the left side because he's got a shorter side on that side of his face. So if you try to get rid of the cant of his occlusal plane, his teeth would show more on the left side and less on the right side. So that would not necessarily be something you'd want to correct. So a lot of the things I learned in dental school, while they were maybe good rules of thumb to get a freshman dental student, you know, thinking about where to put teeth, they don't, they, they aren't the sophisticated way to place teeth in someone's face. So the mid third of the face in, in this, in, in John's case was 71, the lower third was 74. So the reason why that's important is if you've got some space appropriation issues, that where you want to have, you have worn teeth and you want to try to restore the normal contour back, increasing his vertical dimension of occlusion is really not an option for him because it'll just make his lower third of his face appear longer. Um, lip length is 21 millimeters, mobility is seven millimeters, repose is five millimeters. So five millimeters in repose is a little bit excessive for someone that is, you know, like 38 years old. He probably should be somewhere between two and three. So he would have some room to do, uh, you know, a, a maybe a slight bit vertical maxillary excess. So if you look at his profile, we we take a look at this. We look at the palatal plane there, and we look at where that anterior nasal <coughs> spine is. Maybe it's back just a little bit from there. But where his teeth are, the whole the not only is he class two with the with the mandible to the maxilla, he's class the whole maxilla is retrusive. So when you look at this case, his numbers look good, kind of when, when, you, when you look at his, if you were to look at his numbers in a Ceph, but both teeth are back. And then we look at the radiographs and he's, you know, obviously heavily, heavily restored. Um, 
but he's, you know, periodontally, you know, he's got good dental alveolar support and everything. He's really pretty healthy patient. He hasn't had any like uh, bone loss in approximately. He does have some space appropriation issues as far as intraradicular space with the teeth, not only because of the crowding in some areas, but because of the restorations, um, not giving you that nice bell-shaped uh, curve to the interproximal tooth structure. Um, the temporomandibular joints are robust. He doesn't have any TMJ issues. We go through all that type of thing. Um, and we'll go through a smile analysis. So the first thing is, where are the central incisors? And we, we need to determine where do we want to put those central incisors. So there's five aesthetic keys that Frank Spear talks about uh, with the uh, Spear Institute now. It was the Seattle Institute when I was in, you know, getting the information involved with it. Um, midline, incisal edge position of the central incisor, incisal plane to occlusal plane, incisal plane to smile line, and then gingival levels. So let's look at what that means. So if you look at him in repose, he's a little bit excessive in repose, all right? Probably doesn't need to show five millimeters. Um, if I look at his excessive gingival display, we need to kind of figure out what is the reason for the excessive gingival display? And is it, there's seven reasons for an excessive gingival display. Hypermobile lip, um, short upper lip, vertical maxillary excess. Um, all of those have the same amount of excessive gingival display in the front as in the posterior. In John's case, if you look at the molars, he doesn't really have an excessive gingival display where the first molars are. It's mainly in the anterior. And so the canine on the left side is probably in the pretty decent position for his uh, maxilla. And I think he's a little tipped the maxilla is tipped down in the front. So that's probably where some of that VME is coming from, that component in the anterior. But it's really not a true VME where it's the same in the front as in the back. So he's also got a little bit of uh, anterior over eruption as a component and compensatory eruption due to wear. So the, the ones that have more display in the front than in the back is anterior over eruption and compensatory eruption due to wear. And then you go back into the short teeth. Um, when you see short teeth, the, the, the reasons could be because they have wear, or if you can't find the CEJ, it could be altered active eruption or altered passive eruption. In this case, we can find his CEJ everywhere. So it's not altered active eruption or altered passive eruption. It's probably anterior over eruption and compensatory eruption due to wear a combination. So here's his incisal edge of his centrals. There's his midline. Midline's not too bad. Um, the, uh, so we're looking kind of where the incisal plane is. And if you look at in a, in a, uh, lateral view, you look at where the posterior occlusal plane is in, in the upper arch, um, the incisal edges of the maxillary teeth should probably be down a little bit further. And if you added more tooth structure to those central incisors, you certainly would have the incisal plane out of line with the occlusal plane. You'd have a stepped occlusal plane like you're seeing in the lower arch. So the only reason why that looks halfway decent is he's worn those teeth. <laughs> this is another view we like to look at. If you look at this view here, the smile shot, he's, he's kind of like missing the teeth could come over to the left side more. The, he's got a, kind of an excessive buccal quarter there. And the teeth on the right side are a little bit too, you know, full in that buccal corridor. If we look at where the incisal edges are relative to the smile line, you can see that the teeth can move to the left a bit to kind of fill out towards that smile line. And in this 12 o'clock view, you really would like to see those incisal edges closer to that yellow line where the wet dry line of the lip is. So these are the things I'm looking at when I'm trying to figure out where do I want to put teeth. He's got irregular gingival levels, so we would need to try to align those gingival levels. One way to do that would be to do it with uh, surgery like um, an aesthetic crown, not aesthetic crown surgery, because it really would be an aesthetic crown exposure. It would be just trying to you know, do crown lengthening to align the gingival levels. But the problem isn't the dental gingival complex, the problem is the position of the teeth and the wear on the teeth. So it's a position problem, it's an orthodontic problem, and then a wear problem, that's a dental problem, to get the proportions back to the teeth. So this would involve ortho. 
And for me, what I'm keying off of is that papilla on the left canine, because I feel that, ca that left canine is the closest one to the ideal position. And we would like to get all the papillary levels at that level. Anything that's not at that yellow dotted line position has super erupted. And that's where the free digital margin of that canine is. So ideally, we would probably like to push those centrals all the way up to that line and the canine all the way up to that line, and then the laterals to be in an appropriate position to that line. That's probably a little bit too far to attain, but maybe with fixed anchorage that could become closer to that. Um, I do feel that there's probably a component of uh, it's kind of a um, counterclockwise tipping of his uh, maxilla that, or I mean a clockwise tipping of, of the maxilla that is making it show a little bit more in the anterior than the posterior, but maybe by about a millimeter and a half. So here's his smile that he's kind of like learned to do on the left-hand side. Then here's where we really try to get um, that full smile. And that's the gingival display. So we're looking at the uh, position of the central incisor midline. We're looking at uh, incisal plane to occlusal plane. We're looking at incisal plane to smile line. And we're looking at the gingival levels or the gingival display. And we can get all these uh, numbers and, and things into a nice little uh, uh, graph here to help us when we go to look at what's off. These are the core aesthetic values from Rouse and Robbins. And there we've got the core values as what's ideal in the first column, and then the case values of what he actually has. And so anything that's got an X that's abnormal, we're Xing that out, and those are the things that need to be corrected. They've got a nice book, Jeff and <clears throat> Bill have got a great book on describing this and how to get these these values but you know basically I have my assistants or Lynn gather this information before I ever go in the room. Occlusal analysis we want to know you know what are the posterior determinants of the occlusion you know the condylar inclination you know we, we go ahead and we get upper cast lower cast and a protrusive uh, record to uh, set the condylar inclination on the articulator and then we also get um, an interocclusal record in a fully seated condylar position so we have the orthopedic position of the lower jaw to the upper jaw so we can have a true uh, uh, assessment of the jaw to jaw relationship with the patient. And then we can take a look at this and we can see he's heavily restored. We can see some teeth or restorations are failing. Um, and, you know, we can start to say, well, what do we want to try to achieve here? And while I'm counting, talking to these things, you know, talking about where and stuff like that, Lynn is kind of writing these issues down and she will write it down uh, on this uh, risk assessment. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So what we're talking about, it, and, and, and again, they're, they're watching too, so we can really break it down. We can really unpack it. And especially with this case, looking at it, you know, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of moving parts here. It can be overwhelming. So break it down to, into aesthetics first. And it's also a great way patients will say, well, I don't care about aesthetics or, or this is really important to me. So we write down what their problem is, what their risk is, but then by the same token, they see what the, what the issue is and what the treatment could be and what their risk is. Functional, um, you know, same thing, how they're functioning, what the occlusion is, what the treatment would be based on um, their problem, structural integ integrity as far as, you know, teeth break breaking, fracturing. In so many cases, I mean, this can be used, it doesn't have to be used for a complex case. It can be used for a person who's fractured a molar. It's like, yeah. okay, here's... For what one example would be structural integrity of the tooth. Let's say someone has a large amalgam in, in their mouth and they have fractured, a, or they maybe they didn't fracture a cusp, but they'd say they've got the K around the amalgam. One of the treatments we could do there would be to do another amalgam. And that would lower the risk from maybe high risk, red, down to yellow. Another thing we could do is we could lower the risk by doing an onlay, which would take the, would not only would it get rid of the decay problem from progressing, it would restore the structural integrity of the tooth and prevent it from fracturing. So that might take it all the way down to the green. You know, so the patient, you know, to me, it's not a matter of judging the patient like, you know, oh, you don't want to do, you know, my best and finest work and online. You know, if somebody maybe just got hit with a divorce and they're, you know, really, you know, hurt with all some money, you know, and the last thing they need is to take on an online right then, 
you can do a amalgam or, or, you know, a composite if you want and, and, you know, at least get the caries from getting worse. So they're not going in a root canal or have to take the tooth out and have an implant, which is even more costly, but they can go ahead and preserve the structure. They can restore the structure to the tooth to preserve that biologic health. So they're less likely to go on to need a root canal or have that fracture and go on to need an implant. So, you know, it's like, it's like a, you know, maybe a, you know, Two thousand dollar problem or something like that to do the onlay, and then you know to do a root canal and an onlay or, and a build up or something might be more like a four thousand dollar problem. And if that thing cracked, then you're into like an eighty five hundred dollar problem with the bone graft implant and all that kind of stuff. So my thing is, I'm trying to, I'm trying to reduce the risk earlier on before, so things don't come into bigger problems. So we would like to get, uh, you know use the diagnodent to get decay out of grooves of teeth early and do real small preventative resin, resin type restorations. Get them into ortho younger where we can go ahead and get the right force distribution on the teeth. Maybe restore somewhere early with just composites and some bleaching so they don't have to do veneers and kind of push more major treatment and dentistry further, further out into their 40s, 60s, 70s so that they don't need to do uh, complex dentistry. You know, to me, you know, it's unfortunate when people get into a situation where they have this complex dentistry, oftentimes they've been seeing a dentist and it's been kind of supervised neglect because the dentist never really, you know, had a way of engaging the patient in a discussion with what's going on in their mouth, either because the dentist didn't know or because the dentist, you know, didn't know how, what was going on in the mouth and didn't know how to break it down or the dentist didn't know how to approach him behaviorally. Sorry for cutting in, but... No, oh, that's okay. I think yeah. I explained yeah. it very well. Are you good with that, Rick? That yep. slide? Okay. It's good with that. So digital smile design. Digital smile design lets us uh, sort of take this patient and break this down as far as where we want things to go aesthetically. So we cut out that smile right there, and we can then go ahead and start to uh, make some suggestions for our technician as far as what to do with a diagnostic wax up. Um, we can take these little rulers and we can, if we measure the distance from uh, the distal of the central to the distal central, say we get 17 millimeters or something like that, we can stretch that ruler in Keynote and we know that anything we measure on that slide has been calibrated for that ruler. And we can then go ahead and start talking about the proportions we are looking for and where we kind of want to put those teeth, with those little boxes. And now we can kind of set those teeth where we want them. And from that, we can then determine, you know, like where the pink, where the gingiva has gone up beyond the pink, that's how far the tooth needs to be intruded. If I slid this silhouette down so the uh, gum line of the silhouette matched the gum line of the tooth, I could see how much it was hanging down beyond the tooth, and that's how much needs to be added. And I can use these proportions from Sterrett's article from Journal of Clinical Periodontology, 1999, um, and we can use these proportions as far as width and lengths and intrinsic proportions of the teeth to then come up with a plan for what size and shape teeth we have. Now, I just had a lecture at the Restorative Academy this year, and there was a young fellow talking about the you know, greatness of digital technology. And I'm, you know, I, I do like some of the digital stuff. I still think the analog works better in a lot of ways. Um, but they were talking about artificial intelligence to come up with like different tooth forms where the computer would come up with different tooth forms to fit that um, shape and size that you've given for that patient. And um, it would give you a much more uh, natural appearance of teeth because most technicians and dentists only have like one, two, or maybe up to four different tooth forms that they can fall back on. But anyway, the digital smile design here lets me then talk about the width of the teeth and then the desired width of the teeth, the length of the teeth, the desired length of the teeth, how much length needs to be added, how, what, where and how much the teeth need to be intruded. So I can give my technician, or I mean my, my, uh, my orthodontist specific, well actually first my technician for the diagnostic wax up, but then my orthodontist specific numbers of how much the teeth need to be intruded. Number four needs to be intruded, uh, uh, I mean number seven, sorry, it needs to be intruded four millimeters, whereas number 10 only needs to be intruded about one millimeter. So, um, this information can be imparted to the technician to kind of come up with a, a prototype or a orthodontic setup and diagnostic wax up and then direction given to the orthodontist of what to do. 
if you look at this, this is where we'd like his teeth to move out to. So they need to move further out on the left side than the right, which corroborates with his smiling photo. This is kind of the digital smile design position we came up with. And um, this is kind of, uh, you know, just something that we are, we kind of make the, the, the teeth, the right color and shape where we want them. And I actually cut that lip out and then put the lip back over the teeth where I made them. And this is his, okay, so going back to this shot here, we needed to bring him more out on the left because of this smile shot. You can see the corridor, the buckle corridor on the left is greater than on the right. <clears throat> now, um, working with Dr. Forbes in this case, he was using 3D Ortho Insight as his planning tool. There's Sure Smile, there's a, a bunch of other ones. Um, but this actually corroborates with the cone beam and where we want to position the teeth. And he had, he said, you know, hey, I put those uh, those those models together to, sh you know, show where we need to put, you know, John's teeth. And so I said, good. But I did my digital smile design, and you know, we looked at his, and he had moved the teeth more on the right because he wasn't really looking at the digital smile design and relating it to the face and smile, just idealizing the arch forms here. And and while it was nice what he did here it would have not really accomplished as great of an aesthetic result as if we corroborated it with the digital smile design. So then we went back to the drawing board and working together with my input from what I wanted as far as like, like setting a denture in the patient's face, we moved things out a lot further on the left side and, and not so much on the right. But then with this, we got, we got true numbers and we could get these numbers. These just say, you know, how much you're gonna intrude the tooth, how much more space you need, gives all the movements that were accomplished in 3D Ortho Insight. Doesn't matter what tool you use you know, the, with the orthodontist. And then Don Cornell, who's a fantastic ceramist, works with Jensen and their digital workflow. And it's done a lot with uh, developing um, the zirconia restorations, the monolithic restorations with the Mio, uh, or Mio, I mean, uh, 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 it's, a, it's like a way to shade the teeth that lets you do monolithic without layering. And it's almost indiscernible from the layered uh, re uh, restorations without chipping then. You don't have the chipping issue. So <clears throat> here's where the teeth were then moved. He created a plane. First of all, he, first of all, he had a, a you know, we, we mounted it in a fully seated counter position. He got the tooth positions. Then he cut a plane out. So he had a reference with the upper arch and he, put the teeth back into that original reference and he waxed it all into position. And then he moved the teeth out, two and a half on the left, one and a half on the right. And he was able to move these teeth to line up with those little dots. Now you could probably do this virtually, but um, still, I don't know if it was as good as the analog because there's something kind of somewhat lost in the three-dimensional uh, representation on a two-dimensional screen. Um, I think that we don't, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had this happen with you with the implants where it looks like the implants in the perfect position, you know, coming up through the emergence profile of the tooth uh, with your planning software and your surgical guide. But when you use like a shell of where you want that tooth to be surgically, sometimes it's kind of coming at an angle that's not actually what was represented on that two-dimensional screen. So I do still think there's an advantage to these analog approaches. But what we did is we moved the teeth to where we want them to create the right size and shape of the teeth and then waxed in the correct size and shape of the teeth. So Don Cornell did all this. And this can be something that is used then to help in uh, trying to get the right orthodontic position. And then we come into an action plan. So once we get the action plan going, the action plan is something that's developed after negotiating a future choice. This is after then we've after we've had a uh, IDT consultation with you know uh, the specialist. So in this case, it was Dr. Forbes, uh, Dr. Mandelaris, myself, John. We all sat down. We came up with a plan, and then it was up to Lynn and I to come up with these actual. Um, phases and the phases come off of an outline. So if you want to know more about that phase, phase one, phase two, there'd be an outline with a description. And Lynn, you might want to speak a little bit to how you generate that. Okay, so basically at the treatment planning session when they've talked about what what we're going to do, what the priorities are, and, and again after they've had the, all the meetings, 
um, with the IDT doctors, what I will do is, as he said, in paragraph form, oops, losing that. Paragraph that, was the second, form. that was the second half I put on there. So that was 20 oh, okay. phases, not just 12. So okay. that was just continuing, yeah. Right, so this is just a great, so again, it corresponds in paragraph form to more explanation or treatment plan, but the patient can kind of, from this, it's a great visual to see, this is where I'm at, this is where I need to go, this is what's gonna happen next. Um, and with that, they will come in after we've done the treatment planning session, I will present the treatment plan and the action plan and the timeline to them. And at that time also, first we'll go through that, and then I will present them with a fee schedule that parallels the treatment plan. So then that way we can really sit back and, and you know, look at the, the overall plan and what their emotional currency is going to um, require and also financial currency. And from here too, we're, we're also negotiating again, also you know, kind of figuring out what's gonna work best for them. But this is something they'll they take home with them and, and it's, kind of their, um, it's kind of their deed, if you will. It's that they can follow as they're going through treatment. And this is a fluid document. Things come up in treatment where maybe we didn't have to do something we thought we had to do. We could take things out. We can alter this. But this is our best guess at the beginning of the case. Um, so in this particular case uh, for John, this was uh, Simplant, uh, I believe, was the simulation software here. And the gold teeth are where he is at the beginning of treatment. The red teeth was where he ended up. And they merged the red tooth position to the pre-op bone, which is purple. And that shows you how much we would have pushed those teeth out of the bone, the red. So the, the, the red on that purple is not reality. It's the position after we did SFOT superimposed into the pre-op bone. So a couple of years back, we were talking and we had looked at uh, you know, some of the, the Brout study and crestal bone and radicular bone and how thick and thin it was. And so this was kind of like one of those nice little rule of thumb type things um, of what to do for this different types of treatment. Um, kind of like the Tarnow uh, article where it talked about like five millimeters from the base of the contact uh, to the uh, interproximal peak of bone. If you have five millimeters, you'll have a, you'll have a, you won't have a black triangle, you'll have a papilla there filling it, you know, most of the time. So this was just kind of like evaluating what do you have with the phenotype of that particular patient. So we looked at crestal, which was bone four millimeters down from the CEJ, and then radicular, which was bone halfway down the root length. And so in the first one here, you know, there's, there's really four different types. There's thick, thick, thin, thick, thick, thin, and thin, thin. Um, thick, thick never exists, but it doesn't need any treatment. But thin, thick, okay, is a C, it would be a connective tissue graft. And that's typically what we do uh, when we see some recessions on patients. We send them to the periodontist to do a connective tissue graft. But what if you're looking at recession that really has this underneath, okay? And so would a connective tissue graft really be the appropriate model? And really, what would you do in this situation? This looks robust. But if you put your finger down here, it looks like it looks corrugated. You know, you can actually see the roots almost popping out. Uh, and you've probably all seen that with your patients. So this one here is the snake pit. Okay, if you don't do a bone graft here, you can turn this patient into that patient if you expand the arch form. And taking out second or taking out premolars, uh, first premolars doesn't help this situation. You know, you still have this kind of thin phenotype. So in my mind, the thin, thick uh, you know, presentation could use a connective tissue graft. And we can figure this out with a, with a cone bead. The thick thin needs just a bone graft. And the thin thin uh, needs a connective tissue and a bone graft or alloderm and a bone graft. So just to kind of, you know, wake up the periodontist right now a little bit, here's some blood and guts for you. So this is the patient, <laughs> this is George Mandelaris doing uh you know, reflecting back and you see how the bone is very thin around those canines, very thin, uh, like paper thin bone everywhere. And the corticotomies were done. These are done three millimeters apical to the interproximal peak of bone, five millimeters apical to the uh, root tips, just like an orthognathic case would be. You go three millimeters apical to the interproximal peak of bone so you don't lose your papilla or the support with the bone of the papilla. 
And then he puts in the uh, mineral ass to thicken that a bit. I think you can put too much in and make it look like a bean bag. I think, you know, you know, people don't have five millimeters of bone around these teeth. And if you did, it looks funny. So we're just, lay I think you can just layer in, um, you know, a couple millimeters, you're gonna get a little resorption. But when you do these cuts, you get something called a wrap phenomena. The bone gets kind of soft and you move the roots and the bone kind of goes with it. You kind of distort the dental alveolar bone. You're not moving the tooth through the dental alveolar bone like traditional orthodontics. Um, you know, this is, you know, earlier on in our SFOT work and I think probably we would use less bone here than we did right now, but it worked and you do get, you know, you do get a fair amount of resorption. So, you know, you gotta, that's kind of the art of it all, what to do with how much bone. Here's the lower. And you can see that muscle attachment into the lower, which really thins out that dental alveolar bone. And then here's the before, here's the after. And look at how much bone, how much, you know, how much the bone is uh, dropped here on that number 22. And then you got a nice thin amount of bone here that you maybe would maybe not even pick up in a cone beam. That's, you know, cone beams are a little bit deceptive. They sometimes don't show what's really there. But, you know, the, the, uh, the cuts were made, the perforations were made for the angiogenesis and the five and five millimeters in driven with an osteotome to help break up that medullary bone a little bit to create that wrap phenomena. You want injury because if you don't use injury, if you use piezoelectric, it's too kind to of the bone and the bone will harden back up too quick. You want that, you know, cut th two, three months of wrap phenomena to be able to do the major movement of your teeth. So then everything's closed up and the braces, the, uh, the uh, wires are put back in and the movements are made uh, with some heavy wires. Dr. Forbes is great at this. He does all the bending and stuff himself. Um, and, uh, and so this is like one month post-op that got all unraveled like that. So it's only one month. So the continued orthodontics was done. Um, this is what it would look like if the bone graft wasn't done. This is what it looks like with the bone graft in place. So we're trying to basically, um, you know, the Wilco brothers did a lot of heavy lifting on this type of thing and they show there's less relapse when you do the, uh, you know, the, the corticotomies and the bone grafting um, at five and 10 years than traditional orthodontics. But definitely we don't have this periodontal, periodontal annuity that would give us, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, connective tissue grafting to do the rest of our life with this patient or whatever. Um, this is basically giving us a nice, robust periodontium around those teeth. Um, the reason why we want to have that, uh, that lower arch um, covered with the bone and expanded is not just because of what's happening with the orthodontics and, and things like that, but we want to be able to get this anterior articulation where we get about two, three millimeters of horizontal and vertical overlap of those teeth. So we use a fairly permissive angle of disclusion. We want to get separation of the posterior teeth. Um, we want that permissive anterior guidance, um, like they talk about with the Panky Schuyler Mann or Dawson kind of model of occlusion. So it's a fully seated condylar position, posterior sim simultaneous posterior tooth contact and centric arc of closure, and then the anterior artic ar protected articulation. So. Here he is at one year post-op, and you can see these teeth probably could have come up a little bit more. Um, you know, they, I don't know if we could have used, uh, you know, some absolute anchorage would have helped. So we did have that driven up a little bit more, and then we did another digital smile design here. Well, he did want fake. He did want fake white teeth. Okay, so um, you know when he picked what he could have, he wanted bleached-looking teeth, and, and it looked ridiculous, really, to me. And so, and eventually, we talked to him, well, his friends, who are some of them in dentistry, kind of said, "Hey, you know, that's too white." You know, so and then we had already told him that, and so he agreed. And we went ahead and did a little digital smile design thing here, and we did a mock-up of where we want some corrections to be done. And this is what we're going to try to go for. So this is kind of giving us an idea where we're at. And, uh-oh, there we go. Oh. So what, what I wanted to uh, 
George to do is this, this lateral needed to go up more, but we were kind of done with the treatment. It's back a little bit. So George did a little crown lengthening here. And you can see that in the post here, we didn't really hit our goal of where we wanted these teeth to be with these roots. So, you know, one of the things that's exciting about some of the digital technology is to be able to merge like the, like the scan of the teeth, like the trio scan or itero, the cone beam, and then where we want teeth to be with like a diagnostic wax up. And you really get these teeth out far enough to support where we want that facial position of that tooth that we created in the digital smile design. So this was a little bit of a shortcoming. Um, we had to kind of, and then George went ahead and he uh, harvested a little uh, biopsy of bone to show that it was bone. And then that got sent off, that got sent off for histology. This is what he looked like, you know, like maybe a couple weeks after the surgery was done. And this is what came back. So this was, you know, new bone. Um, and uh, that's what's in that. This is part of the graft particle here. That's a blood vessel. So this is actually vital bone that's grown over those roots. A lot of times people don't believe that. Um, here were the provisionals that I thought were a little too white. So we kind of talked them into something tempered down a little bit. And this is what we ended up with, you know. I mean, there's some things that I would like to see different with the gingival levels, but overall, how the case came out, I think it's um, pretty extraordinary from where we started. Before and after the smile. And John, in the before and after picture here, so. Um, you know, he's got nice stable occlusion. His teeth are restored. Uh, some people say that was a melogenesis imperfect. I don't know if it was for sure. It could have been from acid reflux and things like that. Um, John never let us really find out if he was an airway patient. I suspect he was an airway patient. And that might have been what some of that uh, breakdown of the enamel was from acid reflux at night and uh, a little bit of grinding. But... Um, you know, this is kind of the outcome that you can get with some, you know, just kind of breaking things down into the true etiology of the problem. But if you don't invite the patient into understanding what you're up against, you have to accept compromised treatment because, you know, they're only going to go for like whatever the least is. And then you're fighting that uh, going down the road with that patient and it's failing and you're having problems with that. And, you know, it becomes problematic. You can't be successful. So, the co-diagnosis, the co-discovery really allows us to kind of engage the patient. And if they want to compromise, we can say, you know, if you're comfortable with the compromise, you say, well, it's not, you know, lowering the risk completely, but I'm okay with that. If you're okay with that, we can do that. You know, we can do that for now. And, uh, and then, you know, maybe live to fight another day. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. all sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, magic in it. Begin it now. Uh, William H. Murray or John Answers are the two that have been attributed to that quote. And, um, you know, I think that uh, with right livelihood, providence moves with you. So if you're doing the right thing for people and you are really trying to, you know, not just do it for the buck, but try to do you know, correct the true etiology of the problem so you can minimize the amount of dentistry and involvement. I think that, uh, you know, it ends up being, you know, kind of the, the thing that not a lot of people are doing. And so it, it is a, you know, may, you know, if you want to, you know, it's kind of a way to market your practice, you know, it's different. It's, but you do have to understand how to treatment plan, diagnose, you have to have the skill set to provide the treatment. Um, and you need to have the kind of staff that will have those conversations while you're actually working in the back because you don't have time to really, you know, produce and have these conversations. So I'm so grateful to have Lynn as part of my team because she's just absolutely amazing at working through these issues with the patients. So thank you, Lynn. And thank you, everybody out there. So I don't know if there's any questions or anything that uh, you want to go through here, but I'll stop sharing my screen and let you guys show up. I did have a question actually. I had a question on the um, the consult form that you have. Now who's who's writing on that? Is it um, Lynn, are you writing that? Are you asking them that or are you just handing I, it out? 
no, 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 I'm asking that. And I'm writing, you know, I'm writing the cliff notes on that. And, okay. and uh, there's generally a, you know, there's, they're answering with more information. I try to encapsulate it a little bit, but no, that's just, that's part of the interview. And they're in a very, just a very placid, a very comfortable area uh, we're confined where they can, I think they can feel pretty safe. Okay. It's, it's during the, the new patient examination that you're asking that, those questions? So it would be, so the first, um, when they're coming into the practice, we do the new patient interview over the telephone screening, just yes. to kind of figure out how we can help them. And then they're coming in for the new patient consult in the consult room okay. at that point. All right. Uh, at, the con at the consult, do you do any diagnosis? Does it do no. a full exam? No. No. Okay. They have to come back for that appointment? Yes. Okay. So can you tell me what you do in that consultation when they come in for the first visit? So depending on what they need, when they come in for the first clinical visit after I, the I, consult? I have that I made an appointment that I okay. need something, my first appointment when I come in, what's my first appointment like? Okay, so your first appointment is in the consult room with me. Okay. And we meet and we start, I, we, you know, talk a little bit about their background and just, you know, some niceties and, and kind of I try to gauge their comfort level. And so we will go, I will generally go right into the questions, but just very, um, you know, I, I'm not sitting down saying, you know, how may we help you? It's like, how can we help you today? That's right. usually the first thing that we start out with. And from there, it just flows. Right. Okay. And these, so, these are if I if I um, if I go ahead and share the screen here real quick, I'll show you those questions again, just so you, you can see it real quick. Um, and, can you can you see this uh, yeah. these questions? Yes. Yeah. So these are the questions that these are part of the questions. There's, there's more, but this is the idea is to try to find out what that patient's view sure. of dentistry is and what sure. their issues are. Do they see the doctor at all during this visit, or is it just you, Lynn? Yes. So what they'll do is I'll go through the questions and then when I feel like I'm, you know, I've got most of the information, I generally will go and kind of let them know I'm ready and then I'll go back and we'll talk a little bit more and then the doctor will, you know, let them know, hey, Dr. Vince is going to come in. You're going to have an opportunity to meet him. And so during that time, he'll come in and then that's when he'll say, well, you know, tell me what you've been talking about. So then I will, you know, in a nutshell say, you know, John's here today. He's a little concerned. He's got some teeth that's fracturing. He's got some sensitivity. And He's Lynn will usually say, um, tell me if there's, if I've got anything wrong, feel free to jump in. So the patient, you know, if they do feel like something's not being conveyed properly can change it. But if they don't have anything that isn't being conveyed, right, they feel like they have been heard, you know, yes. it's, it's 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 important for the patient to think we understand. Right. It's more important for the patient to feel understood. Right. Understand. Yep. Yep. So when you come in to see them, has has there been any X-rays or any pictures taken, or you just come in? No. 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 We okay. So unlike most dental offices that are trying to be efficient, we're trying right. to be effective. Okay. So so um, what we try to do is we try to have the more like information, get the wheels turning, process for a while, come back, you know, then get the diagnostic information. You know, that's usually a, an hour and a half of gathering information. Right. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, that's enough, you know, they don't, they don't want to talk about stuff right then, you know, so we're going to gather the information. If they want to see something, we'll show it to them, but we usually say, okay, and they're, they're happy to go, you know, and then we're going to, next time you come in, we're going to talk about it again and we'll show you what we found, you know, and then we go over that at the, third and maybe even the fourth visit, you know, with a, you know, the, you know, it might be the fourth visit if we had a new patient too, where we took diagnostic casts and mounted them, you know? So the first time that you meet them, doctor, uh, you're just, you're, you're addressing their concerns as well. You're I'm, I'm, I'm getting the, I'm getting the uh, cliff notes from those questions that I used to ask. She's going through getting all that information and yep. making sure the patient knows that that information has been conveyed to me. Okay. Then the next time we get together, really the assistants and the hygienists are gathering most of that diagnostic information. I just do the, the TMJ evaluation, you know, okay. the, the Doppler and things like that, things that they can't do. But most of the other gather, the gathering they've done, and I just kind of, you know, verify what's been okay. gathered there. That They chart. I'll cite any issues I see between the x-rays and stuff to chart. 
and then we don't talk about we, we we might talk about some of that with the patient like you know we take we, we took these x-rays because we can't always see what's going on do you see what's happening here that dark spot yeah. that means that's decay you know we might explain some of that stuff as we go and we could probably do some more of that with our dental assistants and things i mean part part of our challenge too is to not have this just be lynn and i doing the co-discovery but you know get the rest of the team where they can do it too yes so you know that's you know and they're not doing it all the time they're more technical so it's a little bit harder for them you know yes at what point are, is the patient receiving uh treatment options of what they can have done that was that was down the road that was like on uh so you have telephone consult. They, yep. they make contact with the office. Make sure it's the appropriate office. You know, right. hey, do you take Medicaid? No. All right. You know, <laughs> it's like then the next one is like the new patient consultation. You know, right. and the new patient consultation we go through those questions and we inform them that we are a fee for service dental uh, practice. That we don't we don't take insurance benefits. Yes. The, the insurance check goes to them. You know, and um, you know, are you okay paying a higher fee for a level of service that we provide at a you know, extraordinary level, you know, yes. making sure that that's all good. Then they come in, uh, you know, a third, now the third contact is coming in then, it's the second time they've been in, but the third contact is new patient one, which would be the um, charting of the teeth, you know, periodontium occlusion, all right, that stuff, and get x-rays, okay? And then we may combine that with the next appointment or they may come back a different time for new patient two where you get the mounted cast. Yeah. They might come back another time for digital smile design uh, things, okay, where we take certain pictures for the digital smile design to show them what they might look like. Then we go over in a treatment planning session, aesthetically, functionally, structurally, biologically, yes. what the problems are we find. That's number four or five. Now, the next time they come in is obtaining a future choice. Now you're starting to talk about how do they want to take care of the problems. And yeah. And then after that, then if they decide how they want to take care of the problem, at least in a gross way, you know, then it might be, then you go into, then, then you come up with your final action plan, which then has all the phases of treatment, that, that timeline and fees attached to it. Okay. How can I see if anybody has any questions on here to see? Um, just ask for any questions. If you, would have, you would have seen under Q&A, you would see. Okay, I a see. Group there. Yeah. I see. So far, nothing. Right. I thought that was extremely informative. I learned a lot <laughs> on that. Good, one. nice. Yeah, that was a really good case. How old was that guy? Thirty-eight. Wow, that's a long time to to wait for that, huh? That was good, though. Yeah, right. and he was in uh, he was in braces in like medical school for like six years. Wow. Yeah. And didn't really get the results because they didn't have the bone to put the teeth where they need to be. You know. Yes. At least they didn't take out the premolars. Yes. <laughs> we really do appreciate all your information, uh, all your hard work on that PowerPoint. It was pretty impressive. Really impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you. you know, Lynn and I worked on that stuff together and, you know, and she's, uh, she's really, you know, embodied this so that I can kind of let that part go, you know, and, uh, and know it's in better hands than I can do it. She does a wonderful job. <laughs> yeah, very Thanks. much so. Thanks. You know, if I could just, if there's anything that, as I mentioned earlier, if you t a take away from this and this, the protocols that Dr. Vince has established at the office is go in tomorrow to your practices and ask patients whether they're patient of record, how may I help you? Ask your spouse, ask your kids. Just that reaction or that extension reaching out to patients changes everything. And with that one question, even if you don't, you know, start somewhere, you might not have a formalized list of questions, but how may I help you? will just bring a myriad of emotions and information to you on where that patient really is. And so if I can send you home with anything tonight, it would be just that simple question and listen. Good, I'm gonna try it. I'll let you know how okay. it goes. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Good job, Lynn. Yeah, great thank job, you. Brian. We had, yes, thank you very much, we appreciate it. Did anybody stay all the way to the end? <laughs> yeah, actually we did. Yeah. Good, good for them. Yeah, they were very interested. We had what was it all about like one or one or two, but yeah, it was it was good. It stayed steady. Good job. Great. All right. Well, thanks guys. I appreciate being able to share that. Yes, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Lee. Okay. All right. And yeah. congrats and best wishes this weekend. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a great trip. For both of us. Yeah. <laughs> best wishes for Danielle. You're right. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and, and, and you're back. Hopefully, it'll be okay to travel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We appreciate uh, it. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.